Hi everyone, welcome to devlog number two. I'm your host Marnix and for today's video I've decided to try out a little bit of a different format for the devlog overview. With me I have the different members of the team, Thomas, William and Jamie, and we're going to just be going over what we've been up to in the past month since our latest update. Don't forget, if there's anything that interests you, we also have a more extensive blog post linked down below where we also cover some of the challenges and discoveries we've made in more detail. Also, if you haven't seen the previous devlog, what are you doing here? Be sure to just first check out that one. You can also find the link to that one in the description. So before we dive into what we actually did, let's give a quick refresher about what we had hoped to accomplish last time. Uh, the main things we wanted to work on were our item system and as well as crafting and working a bit more on the workstations. Apart from those concepts, we also had a few more graphical things we wanted to look at uh, so we could make our game feel more like an actual game instead of just something that we press the run button in our Unity engine and just do something with. What I think, and I think you'll find that out as well, is that we managed to accomplish quite a few of those things. Maybe not everything, but let's go over those then. The first feature that got implemented after the devlog was probably the saving and loading game system. This was mostly Thomas's doing, so Thomas, could you please maybe share with us and the viewers uh, a bit more of what you had to do in regards to saving? Yeah, so anytime you play a video game and press the save button, something happens called serialization. So we made a custom object and class that we could send, well, data into, and it was written to a save file. Um, we made multiple save files, so you had a profile and you can have a history of files, but you can also have multiple profiles, so you can actually have different games going on at the same time, actually. Uh, we thought this uh, gave the user a lot of freedom, because you might want to experiment in another world without ruining the one you have already set up. So, were there any tricky things you encountered along the way for saving, something you maybe not have expected uh, that happened? or? Well, it was kind of expected, but we still had some difficulties with making it a quite generic safe system because a lot of things were, well, not implemented yet. For example, the workers weren't completely done yet. So it was hard to make a system that was ready to tackle, well, the ongoing issues that would come later on, like workers, for example. Um, we, had a, we needed to have a way to easily plug new things into the system, basically, because we might also have new ideas along the road. And yeah, we want to save those things as well, of course. One of the other big things that we wanted done for this devlog was the item refactor. We may have talked about it in our blog post before, and it was quite of a big blocker for us, as we couldn't really work on any of the core game mechanics until we knew exactly how we're going to implement items. Uh, both Thomas and William worked on this one. Um, so maybe, before we start into, okay, what did we change? Uh, William, could you maybe say what was wrong with our first implementation of the items to begin with? Well, the issue was that we had an enumeration of all the different item types, but that meant we could have iron ore, silver ore, gold ore, iron blade, silver blade, gold blade. And that meant we already had six different um, enumerations, that, well, six different items that we had to list up, um, which was not an easy way to, to work. It was just too much data in one place. So we now have a new version, but what changed and what's the new advantage of this approach? Well, uh, what we did was split up our material type and the item type. Um, and we also had like a third section uh, specific items. So the specific items were just gold coins. You don't have a different type of coin. You don't have, um, yeah, it's just one generic item. Um, so we, we have a, a set of those. And then we can also make an item based on uh, a material, iron, gold, silver, and a type of item it is, for example, or a blade. And that means we can easily mix and match those two to create more items without having to define each item individually. As you may also have seen uh, on the B-roll that I've been in inserting into this video, uh, our game suddenly has a much prettier UI that actually resembles something that should be a game. Uh, this was something that I worked on uh, the last month, uh, playing around just with Unity's UI elements 
and creating a somewhat cohesive style for our game. Regardless, we needed this UI uh, if we wanted to finally be able to really interact with our game and, for example, go to our control page and change our control settings. Or, for example, Thomas had made a safe load system, but how you do you test it? Well, we need a safe load UI for that one. So we can actually press the save game or press this load game button and really see how we implemented that. Now, I'll be the first person to admit that our UI still is nowhere near perfect. However, I think it's in a pretty acceptable stage, which is uh, currently what we need as far as we are in the, in the development cycle. It gives the player also more of a, a vision of where we want our game and our UI to go with, the actual like high quality UI with like custom sprites and all those things. We can wait with that until the main game um, is finished and we can start polishing all of the rest. As part of our item workflow, which was another big thing, we also not just wanted to create items, but also just buy and sell items. So for example, we want to buy ores. Um, we have been working on the design phase already of the buying part, and we have the mocks ready, but we haven't really implemented that yet. So that's something we're aiming to do uh, by next devlog. But William has been working on, however, um, is the ability to sell items. So around our map, we would have a dedicated marketplace, is what we would call it, where we would send all our workers go, uh, towards to go and sell the items in their inventory. So that could be finished products, like for example, a sword or a bow. The worker would then carry that item towards the marketplace where it would be sold. So William has been working on this one mainly. So William, could you perhaps um, explain a bit what went into that? Well. It the, the hardest part of doing the selling thing was already implemented. It was making sure that we would track when a worker arrives at the building. Um, but we already had that logic, so I just had to add an extra part to it to check, oh, the building I've arrived, what kind of building is it? Is it a marketplace? Yes, okay. I'm just gonna dump my hand for now. It just dumps this entire inventory into the marketplace. And the marketplace then sells everything based on um, the value an item has which is based on um, the item type it is, as well as a modifier based on price, and then potentially in the future, we can have other modifiers uh, be applied there. So what I noticed is that I can't really show footage of this in this video, for example, because we don't actually have the marketplace like models and all those things implemented. So of course, that's maybe a fun question and to ask, how did you test that the code you wrote actually works in a more theoretical way, I guess, then, because we can't actually put down a marketplace yet and sell items that way. Well, I use a neat little thing called unit tests. Um, I, well, I could already check if he arrives at the building, does it trigger, like, do I, does the game know which building it is? Yes, that already works, that I could test in game. Um, but actually, the logic of, like, the worker having an inventory, all that part is not fully workable yet, or I, it's, it's not there yet to actually do that part. Um, and that's why I made, um, well, a, a test case for a few, a few different test cases where, the, um, where I just call the method of the marketplace, where it actually does the, the, the inventory selling part. I give it an inventory and I just check like, okay, do I have what I expect? Like if I sell five iron blades, and I know the price of an iron blade is 20 gold pieces. Do I now have 100 gold pieces? If so, okay, this works. And then I made a few different cases depending on like other items, more items, and whatnot. This brings us to probably the nightmare feature. What was supposed to be just a quick and easy issue, deleting buildings, turned out to become a true nightmare for Jamie. Um, so, yeah, I don't know, Jamie, could you maybe walk us through what happened along the way of this relatively easy issue that suddenly made you work on it for pretty much a month, I feel. So to just give a little bit of context, um, because not everybody knows Unity and testing. Um, in Unity, you've got two sorts of tests. You've got the edit mode tests, which is what William uh, used to create the unit tests. And then you've got the play mode tests. Edit mode tests and, well, unit tests are just like in normal .NET development. Uh, nothing special there. You create your objects, you uh, execute the logic, uh, you assert, and then, well, you check your results. 
Play mode tests, on the other hand, are a little bit more difficult because they need to actually happen while Unity is running the game. Um, so first of all, you need to create a test scene, which is just an empty scene. And then you put everything on that scene that you need for the tests programmatically. And that's where the first major problem started. Um, for our feature that I wanted to test, which was the delete buildings and roads feature, uh, which you'll probably see some videos about uh, during this devlog. So a bit of a problem with that feature was uh, we needed a library rewired for that because we use that to determine if the player has actually pressed the keys needed uh, to be able to delete a building, which is currently right click and I believe left shift, which is subject to change, but that's outside of this topic. Um, and the problem there was in normal unit tests, you'd be able to use, uh, well, dependency injection or just even reflection to inject something different into the code. So it doesn't actually use the rewired library, but it uses a clause that we basically inherited, uh, and then we overwrite the logic. The thing is, there are two problems with that. Um, first of all, rewired doesn't have the option for that because all its classes are locked down and internal, so you can't overwrite them. And even if we could, it wouldn't even matter because everything is static, which is the most annoying part about Unity. So much is static, meaning that there's no way to overwrite the logic. So then Thomas and me uh, dived deep into the documentation of Rewired, um, which is only one of the first libraries we needed, by the way, there are a few more. Um, and we found out that there's a way to create some sort of custom controller, um, but it's very badly documented. Um, sorry, developer, if you happen to be ever hearing this. And it's just not straightforward. In the documentation, it says, okay, you define this method, uh, either callback or with a lambda, uh, and then, in that method, you set the correct key downs. So like if you were to then in the codes, uh, check if the key was pressed, it would return, well, what you set in that method. That doesn't work. Because what it doesn't say in the documentation is that it needs to happen on the next frame. So what you have to do is you have to create your entire test scene, next frame, add the library, next frame, then set the key presses, next frame, and then on that next frame, you'd be able to actually, well, they would have the right values if you would do the, the get button down. The other problem was that, um, well, that was what took most of our time, actually. Um, another problem was that you can't just reference the library uh, easily in tests because there's, well, there's no way to do it. The developer didn't provide any easy way to implement that. So we have to also create assembly definitions for each of those, which is something new that I learned, uh, yay. Um, and it's basically just a file that you create inside of the folder that you need to reference. And you do that for every single folder with files in it you need to reference, and then you have to link them together in Unity, and then you can reference them. But it's, it's not straight, straightforward, and it's also not easily explained. Literally, if you go read the documentation, it literally says this should only be attempted if you have an advanced understanding of assembly definitions, and otherwise just don't use this. Which, well, spoiler alert, seeing as I just learned it, I did not. Five hours later. Uh, once that was figured out, we, well, progressed pretty quickly. Um, and now, future-wise, we can also copy that code. We're probably gonna turn it into like some helper or a library uh, to be able to easily reuse it. But yeah, that all took me, I think, approximately over a week and a half to all just get implemented, which like two days of actual coding and all the rest just brainstorming in my head and with the team. So it wasn't as straightforward as I thought it was gonna be. Um, and it was really not something, it's not really something I d look forward to doing ever again. Um, but now that we have a basic understanding, I think it'll go a lot more smooth in the future, or at least I hope, but you'll have to see in Devlog Tree, I guess. So as you can hear, and from Jamie's passionate speech just now, Testing in Unity can be quite a beast. Don't worry and stay tuned though, because we'll be making an in-depth video about how you can implement all of these things in your own game without you having to go to all of his agony and just suffering. And then of course, we still did a lot of small issues that aren't exactly part of the before mentioned topics, but still deserve to be mentioned. So, lightning round time. First of all, we had some bugs regarding overlapping roads, which you may have seen in the previous devlog. We fixed all of those now and our roads now look pretty. We also expanded some functionality in regards to multi-language support, uh, with currently supported languages being mainly English, French and Dutch, just because those are the languages we know. You can now click down onto a worker to get some fun facts about them, like for example, their favorite hobby or their animal or yeah, whatever. 
We also added support for dynamic world events. Mostly William did this one. Uh, so for example, a war may break out. Um, and this gives a certain faction and a higher demand for weapons. This makes it so that uh, the game feels a bit more alive and you also get some variation instead of just focusing on the one item that will probably be the most meta and like best rewarding and instead switching things up uh, throughout your gameplay. These are just some of the things though. There are probably like plenty of other small things that we're forgetting, but in general, these are all the things that we've been up to uh, in the past month. So what's next? Um, I think first of all that an honorable mention needs to be given to Thomas as he spent the last few days before we recorded this devlog working on world generation but it's not really in a finished state yet so we can't really say we worked on it and we finished it for this devlog. Um, be sure to stay tuned though for that one next month. Apart from that um, what are some of the other things we want to work on? Well basically world generation like I just said as well as finally getting ourselves that functional marketplace, which we already had quite of the, a lot of the groundwork done for, and at least one workstation, probably the refinement station's workflow. So we can really create items, and this would be also the first big milestone in getting our item flow ready from start to finish, from buying to crafting to selling items. Of course, we'll have to see how well we can stick to that schedule, so be sure to check back next month, the 29th of April, when you can check out our latest uh, devlog. So, that brings us to the end of our devlog. If you've managed to stick around till now, please do us a favor and hit that like button to show some support. Also, if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe, hit that bell icon as well, as it really helps us out. That's been all from me, thanks to the team for being here with us, and uh, until next week.